All right, everybody. Thanks again for being here tonight uh, and for joining us for this webinar. We really appreciate your time. Um, this event is being recorded and will be available afterwards for you to rewatch or share with others. My name is Brooke McMurchie and I work with the province of BC Columbia River Treaty team and I'm pleased to be your host for this event. I'm grateful to be joining you tonight from the territories of the Lagwangan speaking peoples known today as the Esquimalt and Songhees First Nations, also known as Victoria BC. And I also acknowledge with deep respect the territories of the Tanaha, the Shwetmik, the Silks, and the Sinaiaks peoples whose territories span the Columbia River Basin. It's great to see so many of you here online tonight. There's uh, just over 160 of you and it looks like the number is increasing. Uh, so really wonderful to have so many people listening in. Um, I feel free to introduce yourself in the chat if you'd like. Uh, let us know where you're joining from. So I'm pleased to welcome tonight's speakers, but before I turn it over to them, I'd like to take a minute and share how this session will go. So we'll go over a brief agenda. Uh, we'll start with some opening comments from the Minister of Finance, who's also Minister responsible for the Columbia River Treaty, Katrina Conroy. Next, we'll hear from Aidan McLaren Co, who is a councillor with the village of Nakasp and a member of the Columbia River Treaty Local Governments Committee. We'll then move into a session and hear about the Columbia River Treaty and current negotiations between Canada and the United States. Uh, we'll hear from Stephen Gluck, who's the chief negotiator on the Canadian negotiating team, and Kathy Eichenberger, who is BC's lead on the Canadian negotiating team. We'll pause after that for a few questions, and then we'll move into a session on um, updates from BC Hydro. We'll hear from Darren Sherbot, who is manager of system optimization. And after Darren's presentation, we'll turn the floor back over to questions for the remainder of our time together before adjourning at uh, 7.30 Pacific time or rather an hour and a half from now, wherever you're joining. So just to clarify how to ask your questions this evening, uh, you please could type in your question in the Q&A function. So you'll find that at the bottom of your Zoom screen somewhere, there's a little Q&A box. If you click that, it should open a window and you can type in your question uh, and then hit submit. Please don't type in your questions into the chat as they will be missed. Um, also, please to try type out please try to type out full questions so that we know what topic you're referring to. Uh, so instead of, you know, typing questions like, uh, what does that mean? Or could you explain further? Be sure to include the topic that you're referring to. Please be respectful in your tone and your use of the chat and the Q&A function. Uh, and keep your questions direct and to the point. Please use appropriate language today. Um, just a note that derogatory language or negative comments towards any individuals will not be tolerated and anyone using abusive language will be removed from the session out of respect for the presenters and for others who have joined us tonight. We'll try and answer as many questions as possible, aiming to address some of the common questions that have been sent to our teams and that we've seen in public forums. Uh, but we will be compiling all relevant questions in a summary report after, and we'll circulate it uh, to the to everybody who's registered for this session. Um, it'll become available publicly afterwards. So I think that's it from me. Um, I would love now to turn it over to our panelists. And first and foremost, I would like to welcome Minister Katrina Conroy, who, as I mentioned, is Minister of Finance as well as Minister responsible for the Columbia River Treaty. Katrina, wonderful to see you. Uh, take it away. Uh, thanks so much, Brooke, and hi, everyone, and, and thank you all for taking the time uh, to, to join us this evening. I was watching the names come up on the chat as, as Brooke was talking, and, and they're from all over the base, and so it's really great to see you all uh, virtually. Um, and I, too, want to acknowledge the territories. I'm actually in my office in Victoria, so I'm on the territories of the Lekwungen speaking people, the Esquimalt and Sawneys Nation, and, and I think we're all in uh, people's territories across the, the base, and so I'm, I'm 
thank you for all attending again. I know that in-person events are in, in many ways preferable to virtual ones, but this way we could get so many more people to participate. And also we could have the panel that we have tonight that uh, make sure that we get all the questions answered that you want answered. So again, thank you to everyone for participating virtually and also for the people that are participating on the panel. And I, I just, I wanna start by emphasizing how serious this situation is to me. I, I know it has been a really extremely challenging year for everyone in and around Arrow Lakes Reservoir. And I mean, I've been a resident of the area since childhood and what's happened this year is is really troubling. Uh, this this part of the world that that we're talking about is, is central to my own history. It, it's where I grew up, where I grew up camping and swimming and fishing and boating on the Arrow Lakes. And now my and then my family's done that. And now my grandchildren are doing it with with my kids. And it's, it's uh, you know, the lake has been uh, part of my life since childhood for more than half a century. So like like all of you, I am not pleased to see the impacts that we've witnessed this year, the impacts on recreation, on tourism, our, our economy, and, and our fish and wildlife habitats, just to name a few. I've shared your frustration over this past summer and into the fall, and I know many of you have been receiving information from BC Hydro, from, from my constituency office, and the province's Columbia River Treaty Team. But we felt it was really important to bring everyone together to provide further updates and, and to correct some misinformation, but answer some of your questions. As the minister responsible for the Columbia River Treaty and, and as MLA for Kootenai West, it, it's really frustrating to be faced with a situation that feels like there's, there's very little that you can do to fix it, as you can imagine. And we, we can't change the severe drought conditions that have affected the entire province this year. And at the same time, it's extremely important that we prepare to meet BC's anticipated electricity demand this winter by holding water back in the, in the Kimbasket uh, Reservoir. And BC Hydro, they'll speak to that a bit more later. Another key reason for the situation this summer is, as many of you know or are learning, it, it's our obligation to meet legal requirements under the Columbia River Treaty, which require BC to send a certain flow of water to the United States at specific times of the year for, for flood protection. And in this case the, of, of this summer, uh, power generation purposes, as well as for fish. So the treaty has been part of the Columbia Basin since the 1960s, and there's a critical need to improve it. What, what worked over half a century ago, it, it just doesn't necessarily work today. And how well it worked, even all that time ago, that depended on who you ask. Uh, for the respective governments of the day, it was no doubt an unqualified success. But for the people who lost their homes and their livelihoods, the communities and First Nations left out of the process, and the ecosystems that were inundated and, and disrupted, it was devastating. And even though the treaty has prevented damaging floods and, and supported us empowering our homes and businesses, many impacts continue to this day, as, as you all know. I don't need to tell you all that. And improvements are needed. Um, that's why since 2018, Canada and the U.S. have been in negotiations to modernize the Columbia River Treaty. And I, I, I just I want to point out here that that because I am B.C.'s minister responsible for the treaty, that position doesn't give me a magic wand. I can't cancel the treaty or change its terms or requirements. I have responsibility within the government of B.C. to support B.C.'s involvement in the treaty negotiation process. And the negotiations currently underway to modernize the treaty are, are nonpartisan. I, I want to make it really clear that there are no elected officials sitting at the negotiating table, myself included, and no one's at the negotiating table on either side. I know people have always asked me, you know, how's it going at the table, but I am not at the table. And I think that's really important to clarify. You know, we have an excellent team of what I call our professionals working on behalf of British Columbia. Uh, that is the BC Columbia River Treaty team. And, and you'll hear from them tonight. You'll hear from Executive Director Kathy Eichenberger, along with Canada's Chief Negotiator for the Treaty, Stephen Gluck. And while I'm not part of the actual negotiating team at the table, I'm in frequent contact with the BC Treaty team and, and federal and First Nations leaders to discuss what needs to change. And I want to stress how seriously I take the letters sent to myself and to the treaty team 
as, as well as the photos and posts that we see on social media and, and, and the news reports, whether they are about Arrow Lakes or, or the, the treaty in general. And all of this input feeds into and strengthens our negotiating positions so that we can create a modernized agreement that better supports the basin's ecosystems and, and the people who live here. I, I have full confidence in the negotiating team, which, as I said, includes Canada, BC, the Tanaha, Shuefmik, and, and Silk Okanagan nations. And they are working extremely hard to modernize a treaty in a way that benefits the BC Basin and, and are advocating strongly to make improvements that reduce the type of impacts we've seen on the Arrow Lakes this year. And this process, it, it's strengthened by our close co collaboration with the Columbia River Treaty Local Governments Committee, who, who've been a critical voice for Basin communities since 2012. And by all the input we've received from Basin residents over the past 10 years since our engagement on the treaty began, we have several people here this evening who can speak to various aspects of what we've seen in, in the Arrow Lakes this year and what's been done to mitigate situations like this in the future. They can answer some of your questions and give you more details and context, uh, context about what's, what's going on. And as I said previously, I, I wish there was an easy fix to what we're experiencing. Often as a, a government minister, I'm confronted by problems and issues that are hundreds of kilometers away. But for me, this one hits very, very close to home. I mean, it's in my backyard. So on this issue and on other matters that, that, that really others that really matter to the basin communities, I'm going to continue to advocate, advocate for improvements to the Columbia River Treaty, not only as an MLA in your area, but also as the minister responsible, but as someone who calls this place home. So thank you again for being here tonight. Really appreciate all your participation. Thanks so much, minister. Really appreciate your comments. I'd now like to welcome Aidan McLaren Coe, who, like I mentioned earlier, is a councillor with the Village of Nacusp and a member of the Columbia River Treaty Local Governments Committee. And though he is neither chair nor co-chair of the committee, Aidan is the representative from the Arrow Lakes Reservoir area uh, and appointed by the Regional District of Central Kootenai. So um, Aidan, take it away. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Brooke. Um, <clears throat> thanks, Minister Conroy, for your comments uh, earlier. Um, as Brooke mentioned, my name is Aidan McLaren Cole, uh, councillor with the village of Nacusp and uh, director on the regional district of Central Kootenai and a member of the LGC, the Local Governments Committee. So I'm here to talk just a little bit about the history of the committee and some of the work that we're doing. Uh, the LGC was created in 2011 to ensure the voices of basin residents and local governments are heard in any discussions about the future of the treaty. Uh, the 10 committee members are appointed by the four regional districts in the Columbia Basin, plus the Village of Valemount and the Association of Kootenai Boundary Local Governments. And as Brooke mentioned, I have the honour of representing the RDCK. Um, all the work that the committee does is based on what we have heard from Basin residents over the past decade of community meetings and ongoing dialogues. And in 2021, <clears throat> the committee pro provided our recommendations on the treaty to the five governments involved. And I'd like to bring your attention to recommendation number 13, which is titled Less Fluctuation in Reservoir Levels. And it includes uh, a couple of pertinent statements. Uh, it is a priority for basin residents that water levels in all treaty related reservoirs fluctuate less to reduce impacts on ecosystems, tourism, recreation, and transportation and that a minimum summer drawdown level is needed for the Arrow Lakes Reservoir to avoid extreme summer drawdowns um, <clears throat> in dry years as occurred in 2015 and 16, and of course this year. Uh, and these dry years are expected to occur more frequently as the climate continues to change. So the negotiating team has indicated that our recommendations uh, don't differ from what's being pursued in the in negotiations, and uh, we appreciate the assurances that the team is strongly advocating for improvements to the treaty so that in the future, the type, types of impacts we've experienced this summer and fall will be reduced. I think it's important that everyone understands, as Minister Conroy mentioned, that uh, the LGC is not represented at the negotiating table. Uh, we have provided our recommendations to the team and we trust that they've incorporated them into the negotiations. And we do of course respect that these negotiations uh, must be confidential and, and we're not privy to the details. I think one of the more interesting aspects of our work is the compilation of information about the socioeconomic interests that are being included in the computer modeling of the river system, which uh, is used to support the negotiations. 
uh, for the Arrow Lakes Reservoir. This includes recreation and tourism interests, such as beach use, motorized boat and marina access, as well as navigation for log towing. Uh, dust storms and erosion are two additional complex factors that we have been working on, including in the modeling as well. And we've also had the honor of working with Indigenous nations that are leading the way on compiling information about um, ecosystem function and the potential for salmon reintroduction in the basin. So if you'd like to learn more about uh, the work that the committee does or our recommendations, um, our website uh, is easy to find at crtlgc.ca. And um, yeah, and then thanks for putting that into the into the chat there. <clears throat> and uh, our email is info at crtlgc.ca if you have questions for the committee. So that's just a brief overview of the work. And I just want to say on a, on a personal note, um, like Minister Conroy, I, I live in the Arrow Lakes Valley with my family in the cusp, and we have experienced this extraordinary year firsthand. And I want to thank all of the residents of, of my community and the valley that have taken the time to share their concerns and frustrations and ideas with me and the committee over the past several months. It has been a uh, a difficult and challenging year for many uh, for a number of reasons and uh, democracy is a participation sport um, and I think it works best when its citizens educate themselves about th these pressing issues and engage with directly with their elected leaders to have their voices heard just like so many of you have done and uh, our committee has been taking your concerns very seriously and we have spoken several times over the past several months to everybody that's here tonight from the minister to the negotiators to BC Hydro and I want to thank the committee and specifically our executive for supporting this advocacy on behalf of, of the Arrow Lakes Valley and, and the whole Columbia Basin and that's it for me so I thank you for listening and for having our voice at this table and I will look forward to the rest of the conversation and any questions you might have so thanks for your time. Thanks very much Aiden. So now I'd like to turn it over to uh, two people who are uh, very involved in the CRT negotiations. Uh, Stephen Gluck, who is Canada's chief negotiator on the Canadian delegation, uh, and Kathy Eichenberger will follow Stephen. So Stephen, I'll pass it on to you. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Brooke. Uh, and thank you, Minister Conroy and, and Aiden as well for your opening remarks. Um, it's It's great to be here today. Um, I've been looking forward all week to being able to uh, speak to you about the negotiations and uh, let you all know how we are approaching it and where we're at so far. Um, first off, uh, just the global affairs team has from the very start of these negotiations valued the perspectives and inputs of the people of the basin. We have worked hard along with our colleagues from the province of British Columbia, the Tanaha, Okanagan, Silts, and Squatmic nations to view our work and our priorities for a modernized treaty to reflect the needs of the basin and the communities living there. It's worth noting the involvement of the Indigenous nations as part of the Canadian negotiating team, and it really highlights how different things are today from how things were 60 years ago. Since early 2018, representatives of the three Indigenous nations have worked hand in hand with the governments of Canada and BC develop and refine negotiating positions and strategies. They are present in the negotiating room and are full participants in meetings with Canada and BC before, during, and after negotiation sessions. And the reason I, I raise that right from the start is, again, the diversity of positions and the various views and so on that have come into um, the positions that Canada brings forward at the table and what we've presented and negotiated with the United States. I would just like to highlight uh, the key items that our negotiating team is advocating to include in a modernized CRT. Um, we are looking for increased domestic flexibility in treaty dam operations to enhance ecosystems, indigenous cultural values, and socioeconomic interests in the basin, in the Canadian portion of the basin. Um, we are looking at updating the flood control provisions and hydroelectric benefits. And we are very much focused on the need to find common ground with the US on bilateral treaty ecosystem provisions and efforts to do everything from, again, look at the ecosystem from not just um, one side, but a sort of one river approach, as well as even efforts to look at studies for the reintroduction of salmon into the upper Columbia. Uh, we are also looking at adaptive management, which allow both countries to adjust to the effects of climate change, including droughts and floods, and other future unknowns. 
Uh, just to provide a bit more information on some of the issues I just raised, um, on domestic flexibility, which is, as I said, a key priority for us, we have heard from you about the negative impacts suffered due to the treaty from both the building of the dams and the reservoirs, as well as the ongoing operations. Uh, we see obtaining a measure of flexibility for our own domestic needs as enabling us to be able to make improvements in the basin. The goal will be to have decisions on this flexibility be focused on ecosystems, Indigenous cultural values, and socioeconomic needs. I will say that even though we continue to negotiate, there is an emerging acceptance that a modernized CRT must include Canadian flexibility. On updating the flood risk management provisions, most of you know that in September of 2024, so just under a year from now, the treaty shifts from an assured flood control regime to an ad hoc called upon system. What this means is that under certain conditions, the US can call upon Canada to provide it flood control. While in theory, this could provide more flexibility to Canada, it may also create more uncertainty. So we are looking to update the flood control provisions to give us both more flexibility while ensuring a degree of certainty for better long-term planning and the ability to maintain and use the flexibility that we are seeking. Also, I'll add, we are keen to work with the U.S. on some of the ecosystem issues, as I said earlier, from the One River perspective, including work on salmon and other ecosystem issues. And again, we feel this is an important uh, area to both look at our own domestic flexibility for our own ecosystems, as well as uh, basin river-wide. Um, I'll just quickly touch on the status of the negotiations themselves. Um, we, uh, we completed our last round in Portland, Oregon just last week. And although we still have uh, a number of gaps that we need to close between us and the United States, we are starting to make progress. Uh, we remain hopeful that we can come to an agreement in principle in the near future. From this, we will come to the basin to update you and discuss where we have landed. We'll keep you up to date as we get closer and look forward to coming out to the region for these discussions. Um, thank you, and uh, I'll be happy to answer your questions uh, once we get to that, but I'll turn it over to Kathy, who can help provide you a little bit more details of where we're at. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you. Um, people, as part of this webinar, may think we're repeating ourselves, but it's a good thing because that means we're a lot, we're aligned on, on a lot of the things that we're working towards. So I hope you don't sound like a broken record. Um, I, I just wanna thank everybody from, uh, for joining us during your supper hour. Uh, and also thank you, Minister Conroy and Councillor McLaren Co for your opening comments. And, and, and Stephen Gluck, my federal colleague, he, he has been working with me on the Columbia Treaty since 2011. So very well steeped uh, in all of the aspects of the treaty, even though he is in Ottawa, but he's actually a BC boy. So um, that's where his heart is. So the, the first thing I wanna say is that I really uh, echo, amplify your concerns about the impacts that we've seen in the Arrow Lakes this year. Uh, I had my home in the West Cooney in the Slocan Valley actually, for 10 years and I just, I moved to the Kootenays to, to or the West Kootenay to hike and, and paddle the Arrow Lakes and, and bike in the area that we're talking about tonight. So um, it, it's, it's, it's heartbreaking for me as well. Uh, and, but during the time that I lived in the West Kootenay, I was, uh, had several provincial environmental roles in the region and also working with the uh, Ministry of Environment. Uh, so when I moved to Victoria and I was asked to lead the review of the treaty uh, 12 years ago, uh, it was an honor, but it came with a sense of purpose, a duty to make things better than they are today. Otherwise, why would we be here? So our Canadian negotiating team, as Stephen said, are very, very aware of the devastating impacts that this year's low uh, water levels have had on, on and everybody and every living thing, um, to communities, to individuals, to families, fish populations and tourism and recreation that is so important 
to the to the area um, and and you know from my own experience I can appreciate how hard it is to see that day after day after day um, so it's it's an incredible place and I know uh, how hard it is for people who live there but also people who visit from from away who come and they don't expect what they're seeing this year so, but I do want to, uh, can you do slide one, Morgan, please? I, I do want to um, dispel some, some misunderstandings around uh, what the treaty is and it isn't. So you have heard that the treaty uh, requirements have caused uh, the a, a significant part of the drafting or the lowering of the reservoir levels. And so, just wanted to start because to tell you when it was created, it was to increase power generation and flood control in Canada and US and to share the benefits equitably. Um, and people ask, well, what's BC's role? Well, Canada, of course, is the level of government that negotiates international treaties with other countries, including the United States. And it did that in 61, but uh, WAC Bennett, our premier of the day, he intervened and he was a driver to have Canada BC reach an agreement in 1963 uh, to um, transfer the requirements, obligations of the treaty, but also the benefits to the province. So that's what happened in 63 and the treaty was only ratified in 1964. Uh, and, and, also, the treaty is, is an evergreen treaty. It, it doesn't end unless one or the other countries issue a termination notice. Nobody has issued a termination notice. As Stephen mentioned, there's one thing that does end and, and it's flood risk management, which I'll speak to in a minute. But the key is Canada and BC, we entered into this treaty willingly as partners with the United States. And so we're committed, as the US is committed, to upholding the treaty requirements. Why? Well, for one, it allowed for the construction of the Columbia and Kootenai dams to provide electricity to just about half the province. And it also prevented and prevents flooding in Trail and Castlegar and other communities, which without the treaty dams, you would have seen flooding definitely in 2012 for those who remember 2012. But at that time, they did things differently. Nobody was consulted or very poorly consulted and, and the indigenous voices were non-existent. And so there's this lens of social injustice that compared to today's standard is still, still raw with a lot of people. So um, for slide two, Morgan, uh, some of the key facts. So Canada, BC, because we received under 63 agreement the obligation to fulfill the treaty, had to build three dams, so Micah, Duncan, and Keenly Side. And the US was given the option to build Libby Dam, which they did, and it flooded uh, into Canada. Uh, and and uh, so that, that basically is the gist of, and you see on the map where the treaty dams are. And often people think Revelstoke is, Revelstoke is a treaty dam, but it is not. It was built after MICA uh, and, and basically MICA enabled Revelstoke to be, to be constructed. Um, the slide three, the current treaty provisions. So what does it include? Well, uh, the power provisions of the treaty allows for the, the management of 15.5 million acre feet to optimize power downstream in the US. Now what's 15.5 million acre feet? Well, it's one acre and one foot deep times 15.5 million shared between Kinbasket Reservoir behind Mica, uh, Lake, uh, Lake, uh, Lake Arrow, a reservoir and then and then uh, Duncan be, Duncan behind Duncan Dam, and so those are the power provisions. And remember, those were developed in 1961. Uh, also, uh, the U.S. because of that have to deliver uh, to Canada uh, 
and BC through our agreement, one half of the estimated potential US power benefits. It's called a Canadian entitlement. Now, the Canadian entitlement is not a dollar figure. It's amount of electricity, if you will, that comes to the border on a regular basis. And that it belongs to BC, not BC Hydro, not Columbia Basin Trust. And it's either sold to BC Hydro for own domestic purposes or sold on the market. The revenue goes into the provincial general revenue that provides services, et cetera, to British Columbia. The other part of the treaty is um, the flood control provisions, uh, and it's 8.45 million acre feet. It's not in addition to 15.5, but it's within that. And, and that storage for flood control is managed to prevent flooding downstream. And that was bought uh, for 60 years for $64 million. And that's the one thing that expires in 2024. So um, what changes? Well, uh, depending on what is negotiated, uh, if there were no changes, the US would have to call upon or ask for uh, the ability to use space in Canada to prevent devastating floods in Portland and, and, and the general area. So those are the basics. Um, and and uh, on the next slide, we understand that there are many people who may not have participated in our public consultation. When we started in, in 2011, we had in 2012, 2013, uh, we started to look at the treaty uh, to see whether we should continue it or terminate it or amend it. And when you say amend, would mean improve. Uh, and so we, in 2012, we started a consultation engagement with Indigenous nations, with local governments who've been uh, uh, such an important component of guiding and advising the province in what the constituents uh, would like to see and the residents of the BC Columbia Basin to we wanted to know what mattered to them and, and what people want to see in a change in a treaty. And so we've had, and you see on the screen, a lot of virtual meetings, in-person meetings, and the in-person meetings were one of the best uh, experiences of my life with just plain people coming together and talking about what they like, what they don't like, and what they want changed. And we will be doing that again. But we also, you know, got up with the times and, and used all the tools in our toolbox to talk to people. And often citizens, regular folks, residents, they're surprised because they'll call me and I pick up the phone and we talk about it for half an hour. And it's very important for me and others to hear directly from voices from the people. Um, so we also have been uh, attending, uh, it, uh, public meetings uh, with, with Canada and with Indigenous nations to keep people informed about uh, what's going on in the treaty negotiation process, but also answer questions and hear from residents firsthand. So um, the, the also there are two committees that we are um, uh, working with closely, and, and you've heard from Aidan tonight about the Columbia River Treaty local government process. And we've been um, uh, seeking their advice for the last 10 years. And there's also um, the Columbia Basin Regional Advisory Committee. And these that, that committee is citizen members and others from across the basin. So people in, in, in Jaffrey can talk to people in, in the cusp, we talk to people in Golden, and, and it's a very rich conversation. And that too guides us on what we should be negotiating uh, for the future. Um, and so, you know, you, you can see where we've been, uh, our virtual sessions, and all of that gives us opportunity to hear directly from Basin residents. Uh, and, and there are, uh, on our website, if you can uh, go to the public consultation, you're going to see a lot of information, but also a report that we produced that it, it's a what have we heard report when we were in all of these communities. And 
we, you know, we wanted to portray exactly what we heard, whether or not we agreed with it. And, and that's a good background. So you can maybe see what you were talking about and see it reflecting in that for people who weren't involved at the time. Um, so um, this, this has given us a lot of opportunity to, to hear people on, and what do they want. Well, people want what they told us, they want to include ecosystem health, the environment. Uh, from fish to birds to wildlife. They want that to be expand, the tree to be expanded to consider those things, including also indigenous cultural values. Um, the people wanted to also uh, see uh, us work towards the reintroduction of salmon that was blocked not by the Columbia River Treaty dams, but by Grand Coulee decades a decade before, but there's a big push to reintroduce them. I hear often about water security in Canada and adapting to climate change, uh, especially in light of uh, more frequent floods and droughts. And so that that adaptive management that is going to be very important going forward. It, it doesn't quite exist or is seen in the current treaty. Um, we hear and you'll hear again and again tonight, uh, managing for recreation, tourism and navigation. And but in addition to that, Communities and local governments want more say in how the treaty is going to be operated or planned in the future. And of course, uh, continuing to uh, enjoy uh, having flood protection and, and hydroelectric uh, power, but also a fair share of the treaty benefits uh, for, for BC. So, uh, we're going to put also a link in the chat about the uh, Columbia River Treaty community meetings that, that hopefully you'll be able to, to look at what I just mentioned. So what are we aiming for? Well, you've heard Stephen and you've heard the minister and, and, and Aiden. And so, you know, what you've, we've heard this year is what we've been hearing all along. Uh, and so, uh, you know, supporting swimming and boating and minimizing dust storms and e enhancing ecosystems. And so people have been really consistent and that's been driving our negotiations. I mean, we've been, we've been uh, in negotiations for five years. What is consistent is having those voices and that advice and, and guidance that we take with us uh, to the negotiating table and it's reflected uh, uh, on and how we are having these discussions with the U.S. So we uh, we are looking at uh, the the key changes that we want to see um, on the flexibility. And one of the things is the flexibility we're looking for is unilateral flexibility. So carving out a piece of the treaty storage operations that we can use domestically without having to have uh, consensus or uh, agreement with the United States. That's important because it will be just focused on our own values and objectives. Um, the We're also looking at uh, how to address, uh, manage ecosystems across bilaterally as a one river concept from headwaters to the estuary. Uh, and um, and then we also don't want to lose uh, benefits that we have today. Uh, so um, these are, are some of the all the things that we're we're driving towards. And you can when you read the communiques that come out after each round, um, you will see that each time we're adding more to it where there's more areas of agreement, and especially and including on environmental topics, which frankly. 10 years ago, 20 years ago, weren't mentioned and, and certainly weren't mentioned when the treaty was, was developed. Um, so we've, we've um, uh, so what does that mean um, for you now and in the future? Okay, that's all nice, what we're trying to negotiate. What does that mean exactly? Well, uh, as the minister mentioned, we need to meet our treaty obligations and to receive its benefits. Uh, in BC, so we we uh, have to provide a certain volume of water to U US at certain times of the year. And the benefits, uh, and, and it's public record, and over the years it's been as low as 90 million, 
and it's covering usually around 150 to 200 million. Last year was a good year. The prices, it's based on the price of power on the market. And uh, the province realized uh, 420 million, which we are sharing uh, a portion with the indigenous nations. So, um, but this year, uh, hydropower generation requirements contributed to the, the lowering of the reservoir level. Uh, and, you know, it's, we know it's all the more hard to see when we see across the border, the water levels are much higher. But, you know, we entered into a treaty willingly 60 years ago. And so that with a bad drought, those are two factors that we're finding ourselves in this year. So that is why we are negotiating for changes to reduce these type of impacts in the future. Um, there's a lot of research and computer modeling underway to see how would we change reservoir levels and operations, dam operations, so that ecosystem and socioeconomic objectives can be improved. And a lot of that is led by indigenous nations and also uh, Selkirk College in uh, partnership with the Conviura Treaty Local Government Committee. Uh, so that work is contributing to uh, river management scenario modeling to look at how can we change these operations and how to best use our flexibility, our, our future flexibility. But first, we have to conclude negotiations on a modernized treaty. We can't do it now. We are right now having to follow uh, the current treaty. Uh, once we have an agreement principle, as Stephen said, we're going to come back to the basin and explain all the different features and what is changing and why and get feedback from you. When that has landed, uh, we'll make changes. And once the, the treaty, uh, modernized treaty comes into effect, we are going to be making changes, uh, to steps to make those changes happen. So, you know, unfortunately, I know you want to know, well, when, when will this happen? And I can't give you an, extra, uh, an exact date, but we will keep you up to date as soon as possible on each step along the way, because, you know, we're, we're, we have a treaty that's lasted for almost 60 years. We're really looking at uh, the future, the future of the environment, the future of the basin and the future of, you know, our next generations. So um, I, I just wanted to talk to you tonight about what we're working towards um, and something we've been discussing for several years now. I mean, we've heard uh, that you, you we heard that you have read that the United States believes we can reach an agreement principle on a modernized treaty this year. And, and I can't predict whether it will be exactly so, but we are very optimistic, very optimistic. But again, it's not going to change the situation this year. There's hope for the future, though, because, you know, we certainly can improve on a treaty that was drafted almost 60 years ago. And so, yeah, it's, you know, it's taken five years to get to work today. Um, if we were less driven by our convictions, by what we've heard from you all and from Indigenous nations, maybe we'd have a treaty already. But we're taking a, a strong stance to ensure that it meets our objectives also satisfy, satisfying U.S. needs. Otherwise, we wouldn't have this, this collaborative treaty. So I know, and I, I, I want to end by saying that I really understand how frustrating it is to know that this terrible situation can't change immediately. But as you've heard tonight, we are working really hard, meeting with the U.S. on a weekly basis to, to get to a place where we could mitigate, uh, you know, uh, situations that we're seeing this year uh, for the future. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kathy and Stephen. Um, I know there's lots of activity in the questions and in the chat. Just a reminder to folks in the chat, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A box uh, so that we can see them. And I already know, you know we're not going to have time to answer everything tonight, uh, but we, really the Q&A box will help us capture all the questions and answer them in our summary report. 
so I think at this point we'll take uh, a couple of questions before moving into our next presentation and then leaving uh, as much time as we can at the end for the bulk of the questions. Uh, and at this time, I'd like to invite uh, Adina Brown, who has been going through the Q&As here uh, and is a ministerial advisor in, in Minister Conroy's office. She's offered to um, help us out here tonight. And Adina, uh, if you want to read out uh, a couple questions for Kathy and for Stephen, I'll invite you to do that right now. Great. Thanks, Brooke. Um, I have here as the first question, if there are not elected officials on the board, and I think they mean on the part of the negotiation committee, um, why would resident input be of any value? Well, I, I hope that I've helped answer that because, you know, we, we are uh, coming to the basin, we're talking to people, we're listening to you, we're listening to local government. Uh, committee and that all basically frames what our negotiating mandate is and at the same time so we we are directly you know partnering collaborating with local government officials in the basin but also um, I report to my assistant deputy minister to reports and we report to minister Conroy who is the 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 minister responsible for CRT so up to the minister responsible, but also to local governments and residents. And so I, I hope that that helps to so, show the connection. And the other thing is when we come back to the basin with an agreement in principle, we are going to show you how your input is reflected in the agreement in principle. And I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, and if I could just add, I mean, I think, you know, on, you know, behalf of the government of Canada, I mean, we are responsive to um, the various, uh, you know, I've been out in the basin uh, many times, you know, been in town hall meetings. Uh, we have a negotiating mandate that is cabinet approved uh, when we first put it together. And, you know, part of that is really uh, a reflection of what we heard and what we present to cabinet to get the mandate to go forward. So we do have a responsibility and, and second of all, to, and to be quite blunt, you know, if we were to go and negotiate a, an agreement and you know, the various elected officials who do make various decisions at the end to ratify these things don't like what we did because we were not responsive, I don't know if they would give us the, you know, the thumbs up, the seal of approval on it. So, you know, we're, we're, we're guided two ways, you know, there is the, we won't get this through if it doesn't meet uh, the expectations of the various elected officials. And two, we are, you know, what we put together and what we are bringing forward in our negotiating mandate, you know, comes from what we've heard and and the various inputs that we've received. So um, I think we are very responsive to um, what we've heard. Thanks, Stephen. Adina, maybe uh, one more? Um, yeah, thanks. The question is, why are the treaty negotiations confidential? Yeah, that's a that's a popular question that we do get, um, and uh, you know we do hear it a lot. Um, there's something uh, in order to really have a good exchange ideas with with call it the other side. Um, it, it's important to um, you know be able to have nego uh, have discussions and exchange ideas without everything sort of being blasted out every detail because. It, it it's important to be able to exchange ideas, exchange the pressure points and all these other things um, in, in, a, in a manner that um, that allows a bit more freedom of conversation. I think it does like if you know we hear pressures that they get on their uh, on their side, uh, uh, they hear, hear ours and so on. it does it, it does allow for a, you know some, freedom to get these ideas out to push them forward um like i mean like i said at the beginning and like kathy said i mean this is not um you know meaning that at the end of the day we're gonna have this um an agreement that's you know we're gonna be in a windowless room where we've come up with the agreement and then we're gonna throw it down in front of everybody it's 
it enables the exchange of ideas moving forward. And, you know, as you know, we've come back many, many times. I know we briefed the local governments group and CBRAC and town hall meetings in terms of giving general updates. But in terms of sort of the sanctity and the movement of the negotiations, it's, it's, it's important not to share every little detail and who said what and what they're saying and little exchanges of ideas. Um, but uh, I realize that's not, everybody doesn't agree with that way forward and it's, potentially somewhat controversial, but that's just the manner of how a lot of these, especially international negotiations go. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Stephen. Um, you know, there are a lot of juicy questions. I, I really have to uh, uh, call out the person who's calling us corrupt. I mean, you know, we're here in good faith and we've explained and, and you know, I think you should hear in our voices that we're sincere. To call us corrupt is frankly, you know, diminishes your your perspective. So I encourage people to be helpful and help us guide towards good good negotiations. And and there's a lot of great questions. If we aren't able to answer them all tonight, definitely we'll be able we will answer them uh, afterwards, and it will be published. Thanks very much, Stephen and Kathy. And I think in the interest of time, um, we'll move on in our agenda and I'll welcome uh, Darren Sherbot from BC Hydro to share his presentation. And, uh, and then we'll move into questions and see how many we can get through before the end of the evening. Thanks very much and Darren, take it away. Thanks, Brooke. Uh, good evening, everybody. And thanks for the opportunity to be here with you today. We've had several previous opportunities to discuss with the basin and the region on the ongoing issues, and we appreciate the opportunity to continue that dialogue. I'm Darren Sherbot. I manage the system optimization team at BC Hydro. Our group is effectively responsible for the management of our annual planning for our large reservoirs and the Peace in the Columbia and the energy management to keep the lights on while balancing all our regulatory requirements. In an average year, it's a somewhat uh, enjoyable job and in challenging years like we've seen, both on the flood side and the drought side, it become very interesting and challenging. On a personal note, over my 20 years with BC Hydro, I've spent a significant amount of time in the Columbia Basin, both as an engineer and a fisheries biologist during the initial launch of water use planning, and later, of course, in operations helping balance water, energy, Columbia Treaty River obligations and our water license requirements. My daughter was born in the Kootenays, so we've spent several winters, summers, skiing, fishing, canoeing, hiking there. So I have a good appreciation for the Kootenays and the soft spot there. First of all, I'd like to acknowledge that we know it's been a very difficult time for those that live around the Arrow Lakes Basin, but also Kim Basket and, and Duncan uh, Reservoir. Uh, these summer and fall water levels are not something that any of you wanted, and I want to be clear that it's not what we wanted either. We haven't seen these levels this low on Arrow Lakes probably since the 70s. And for many of you, this is probably the first time you've experienced a reservoir this low in August and September. It reflects the exceptional combination of this year's low snowpack and the severe drought conditions that we've been experiencing in the Columbia, but also across the province since uh, June and May. It's under these unusual circumstances that we had to manage the system under the Columbia River Treaty obligations. And we, during this time, explored many options with BC Hydro, within BC Hydro and our partners within the Columbia River Treaty to help keep summer levels higher at arrow than what we actually observed now. Um, I'll be sharing some information and observations about how we got here and what we heard from the community about impacts and observations over the course of July, August, and September so far. After this meeting, if you have any feedback on our presentation or like further information, please reach out to our Southern Interior Community Relations team. We're planning on setting up more uh, meetings with the community throughout the season. That's always good to engage with folks directly. I'd also like to note that we've heard from many of our employees in the region how grateful they are for your kindness and patience during this challenging time, as well as your willingness to connect with us and, and share feedback. That feedback is important and helps drive better decisions and communications going forward. And as noted earlier, BC Hydro is also deeply involved in the treaty negotiation process to provide advice and counsel to the provincial and Canadian negotiating teams and leaders from the Indigenous communities and, and local governments. So maybe I'll just start with how we got here this summer and fall. Um, the story starts with the combination of three unfortunate events, both a low snowpack coming in the spring, the local drought, and also the provincial drought. 
Arrow levels can probably be managed within sustainable and respectable ranges with two out of those three, but it's the combination of those three things all at once in a year that made this year challenging and culminated in the levels that we saw over August and into September and October. So to start, as I mentioned, the snowback, we have to go back to winter last year. Snowpack is really important in our operations as it stores water for the spring and then under average conditions provides sort of a steady stream of inflow as it melts in addition to the summer and uh, fall rainfall. This year, two unusual things happened, as we know. First of all, our snowpack was below average to start with in the spring. So that sets us up at least for initial challenge for managing arrow levels at higher recreational targets. The second unusual thing is it melted very early and almost all at once in May. This was almost unprecedented over a record set. And as we look back, we had a highest probable amount of inflows in May, and then of course followed by practically nothing, June, July, August, September. Here we are in, in October. It's both a recent example of extremes and inflow uh, variation that make both planning and uh, management of the system challenging. For comparison, remember even two winter ago, we had a much higher and in fact above average snowpack and we were bringing up flooding in the spring of 22. Seems like a long time ago. Well, low snowpack of course can set us up for lower than average levels. It can and is often offset by the subsequent summer rains and fall rains. This year, of course, unfortunately, was followed by a deepening provincial, local provincial drought. And after the rapid snow melt in May, Arrow, the Columbia Boston, Basin, and in fact, all of BC Hydro systems were subsequently deeply impacted by the dry summer and fall that followed. As you remember, Arrow peaked around 1440 feet, about four feet below full pool in June, and then quickly dropped to, by most historical operations, over 40 feet of the summer, reaching 1400 by the end of August. It's hard to imagine, but we were actually above average in mid-July still. It's the precipitous drop across July and through August, as it started to attenuate and sever that caught the most of the public's attention and exposed many of the issues that we saw both with environment, exposure of archaeological sites, and the exposure of structures and, and uh, debris that would normally be covered in the winter. The lack of the rain this summer was the third problem for Arrow, and it's the provincial perspective. In a given year, we can balance the integrated system between many of our reservoirs, the combination of our generation in the lower mainland, Vancouver Island, and of course, in the Peace. Peace and Columbia systems, particularly Kim Basket, Revelstoke, and Williston count for almost over 50% of our generation. And when one area is in a system drought, we can sometimes balance generation and ameliorate the effects of deeper reservoir drafts, a lowering of the reservoir in those situations. But the drought that we saw across the province this year was provincial wide, and it didn't give us the flexibility. I'm sure as many of you know, Kim Basket, which is upstream of Arrow, along with, with Revelstoke, is a major reservoir for BC Hydro. Its levels were also below this average year. But what the drought did was not afford us the ability to release more water from Kim Basket over this time to further prop up Arrow across that period through July and August. We're also seeing a similar situation in the Peace region, as Williston Reservoir levels were also much lower than normal. As I mentioned before, this accounts for about 50% of the power in the province. Going into the fall, it was important for BC Hydro both to store sufficient energy, both in Peace and Kim Basket and Revelstoke for the upcoming winter. So I mentioned before, when we have unusual conditions in the Columbia Basin or vice versa in the Peace, we can often rely on each other basin to help the other watershed out. But in this case, the drought was provincial wide and our hands were fettered in, in many of the cases. Reduced inflow, of course, is only half of the picture. The other part is about our discharges. And our discharges are managed, as mentioned before, by Kathy and company under our Columbia River Treaty obligations. Under the treaty, we're still required to send water to the U.S. during periods of dry conditions. And perhaps not intuitively, the amount of water that we have to send increases relative to years when we're dealing with flood risk management. This was especially visible across July and August as the re reservoir drafted at levels and at rates that we haven't seen for many decades this summer. I wanna make sure that people know, however, that we did not send any more water than was absolutely required over this course of time. And the water that was discharged was managed daily as part of info forecasts and operation planning and reviewed both by BC and the Columbia Treaty ent entities on a weekly basis. 
Our goal over the summer and through the fall still remains to slow the drafted Arrow Reservoir and carefully balance the remaining water that we have in Kim Basket and Revelstoke coming up into the winter. Perhaps preemptively, one occurring question that has come up in many of our public consultations and forums is about the minimum discharge rates from the, the treaty. Although the lowest possible discharge rate is 5,000 cubic meter uh, feet per second, this does not mean that we can choose to only release 5,000. And in fact, we would only see releases down to 5,000 during extremely wet conditions or flood risk management when we we're retired to hold more water back for flood risk management purposes. As mentioned earlier, during dry conditions, we are actually required to release more water than we would in an average year. And as such, the related release from Arrow far exceeded the inflows from Arrow, both from releases from Kim Basket and our local inflows, which resulted in that rapid draft across July and August. I also want to clarify that BC Hydro has not been exporting any power at the expense of Arrow Reservoir uh, levels. Arrow has been managed to keep levels as high as possible. You know, that's hard to, to uh, fathom given that it went as low as it did across August but also to ensure that Kim Basket Reservoir upstream has sufficient swords for the inter winter energy management. Um, we need to hold water again in Kim Basket and Williston to provide for the winter months. And of course, we'll see that generation appear and prop up arrow as we go through the winter. We have, have an obligation as a utility to keep the lights on for customers. And we know that the demand for generation from Kim Basket and Rebel Soap will only increase as the gays get longer and, and colder throughout the winter. So supporting arrow levels and, you know, looking at the levels that we ended up down currently around 1390 now, it's hard to understand all the work that actually went into preventing the levels from going even lower and faster. Uh, despite the levels that we saw now, BC Hydro has been and continues to work very hard, both with the Columbia River Treaty entities and internally to sit there and try to moderate the effects of the drafts that we saw then and are continuing to see now through the fall. Some things that manifested was a, probably about an eight feet additional offset in arrow over the summer months. And that's what partly allowed us to keep the reservoir higher through to mid-July prior to that draft from July through August. Uh, additional things that we considered were increasing flows from Duncan Reservoir. So those reservoir was drafted lower than would be for that time of year and slightly offsetted the drafted arrow over the summer. And more recently, across September and October, we have continued to negotiate successfully with the U.S. to store probably about additional seven feet of offsetting generation in arrow. And again, this is energy that can be kept in Kim Basket for the winter coming up. Despite this, we still saw levels in arrow that we haven't seen from the 1970s. With the forecast currently in for the fall arrows, barring very major precipitation events that we still hopefully may see through October and uh, November, levels are still likely to, to decline more. Uh, approaching 1380 feet by the end of November would not be unexpected. Although levels that low are not necessarily that seasonally out of line with our winter drafts. What was different this year is of course those deeper drafts down to 1390 and 1400 occurred during the prime recreation season where things were much more visible, not covered with snow and access to those reservoir perimeters was a lot easier. It's always hard to predict what next year's levels look like. It'll be a combination of the snowpack that we received this year and next year's rain. But we do know it often takes about two years to sit there and, and moderate the effects from these big reservoir events that, that carry on. So we'll still be managing the effects from this year's drought next year, even under average conditions. This year's low levels cause all sorts of challenges, environmental concerns, uh, recreation, socioeconomic concerns, unusual access to arc sites that were exposed, and exposure of previous structures and materials associated with the initial reservoir flooding and construction. So let me talk a little bit more about the environment and a couple of topics that have been raised uh, frequently amongst our fishery staff and with community relations. Uh, one in particular has to do with the uh, kokanee axis and their ability to viably spawn and, this year going forward. Every year we work the Ministry of Forests and the Fish and Wildlife Compensation Program to assess and count the number of kokanee spawners on Arrow Lake. In particular, there is a concern that kokanee spawner access may be limited by both the reduction in the local tributary inflows associated with the drought, but also because the reservoir was lower, making it difficult to access those said tributaries. 
Well, still preliminary in Asian, what we've seen this year, surprisingly, has been very positive. This year's company spawner return is good, and access to many of the major tributaries is very good compared to recent years. Uh, there are many factors that contribute to success, but it's hard to know that Kokanee and Aero are resilient to this combination of both low reservoir levels and low tributary levels across the fall. Of course, we've collected a lot of information this year that will help set a baseline, and we'll continue to do that, and this will feed into our future decision-making management and assessments. Another major challenge to us, and what may have been alarming to the public and many of us who aren't even fishery biologists, is the increased visibility of stranding for fish in the reservoir margins along these pools. Again, levels this low may occur in the winter and have in the past, but at this time it's not as biologically active and those pools are covered with snow. It's hard to see and assess out there at those times. Uh, these deeper drafts across August and into September, however, manifested in, in multiple reports of stranding in localized pools for many small fish. Uh, BC Hydro initially went out and started surveying them and starting in September went out and made more dedicated inventories and began salvaging where possible and impractical. It's a monumental task, like almost 500 kilometers of shoreline that needed to be assessed and identified. And with those areas, probably over 160 pools and 30 major sites that were evaluated. The salvaged fish were mostly small and young, things like sculpin, stace, red size shiner, and carp. And that's not to diminish their value from an ecosystem perspective, uh, but the longer term or larger impacts on trout, mountain white fish, kokanee, things like that were not necessarily readily observed. We continue to have crews on site as the reservoir sort of attenuates down to these lower levels of 1390, and they continue to actively salvage twists where possible and reported. Uh, any additional reports or sightings in areas that are identified the public are appreciated and again can be reported to our community relations who can pass that on to our biologists. As mentioned before, all that information will be rolled up and help us assess and make decision making going in forward with respect to fish risk stranding management and how we look at managing the reservoirs. Archaeology also presented new challenges for this year. Again, levels of slow aren't typically seen until the winter, and at that point, the reservoir perimeter is difficult to access and covered in snow and ice. This year, we had multiple uh, opportunities to sit there and look at the reservoir in August and in September at levels that, again, many people have never seen before or we haven't seen since 1970s. Part of this, an archaeological consultant was uh, uh, brought on board and they completed additional assessments in low elevation areas where previous arc sites hadn't been reported or known to us before. And we also revisited some of those exospites that we know about just to see if anything had changed or the erosion associated with it, those level levels had modified the sites. Crew members included many representatives from local indigenous nations and communities. Community Relations and BC Hydro continues to thank them for partnering with us and helping address that issue in real time. The preliminary results, of course, show that many new sites were reported with this uh, option of seeing the reservoir without the snow. And again, several of the existing sites were expanded and inventories were added to that. We also worked with the indigenous communities to mobilize guardian watch programs just to manage how the ARC sites were being uh, accessed and, of course, to educate the public and not manage information with respect to disturbing or, or uh, taking information from those ARC sites. Of course, these areas are highly significant to the Indigenous communities and they're protected under Heritage Con Conservation Acts. Just a reminder, if you see new artifacts, please leave them in place, but uh, report their location to our community relations team and they'll follow up directly with Indigenous nations accordingly. The summer drawdown did allow us, however, one opportunity that we hadn't afforded before was to take some aerial photos of the reservoir without snow and ice cover at details down to around 1390. This will provide us valuable new information, both on uh, exposure of arc sites and also where we may see debris and structures that would normally be covered in ice and snow. Uh, last, I just said it's called with the inventory of structures and materials. So what we're talking about here is original buildings, infrastructures, debris, landfill sites that were part of the original reservoir inundation and filling, and perhaps not seen by many people before, 
uh, until you go back to the 1970s. And again, while the reservoir might get to these levels in the winter, they certainly have not been exposed for uh, people to assess and view. And it may be alarming to many people that we're used to foreshores at higher levels across the summer months. When the reservoir was created, there were a lot of existing structures that were removed or demolished, but many of the footprints, foundations, and existing structures, perhaps landfill sites, were left along the shoreline stores where old communities were located. Normally, as I had mentioned before, they're covered by snow, but these low levels expose them much earlier to access and were also more visible. To many of you, we appreciate seeing these structures without the cover of snow uh, may have been alarming and provides uh, a window into what the reservoir had looked like prior to the inundation. We've received multiple photos and information in the summer of the different debris and hazard sites across the reservoir. In particular, Mayor from uh, Village of Natas, Tom Zinelkik, RDC Director Teresa Weatherhead, Colleen Lake Void on their advocacy in the issue and providing our Southern Interior Communication Relations teams information on where new sites and areas have been exposed. What we've done with all this information and with, with our own properties is cross-reference that and expanded our historical database. We now have crews that are going out and undertaking more detailed inventory of historic structures and materials. They'll figure out what's there, tag it, record it with respect to things that we don't know. And we'll also look into the environmental considerations with archaeological and heritage values, as well as accessibility and public safety concerns. In some cases, if it's possible, we may be able to remove specific hazards and structures if they're not significant archaeological or heritage values uh, to sit there and manage for safety purposes. And in many instances, it'll probably be left in place like it has been for, for the decades past. But we'll do our best to address this issue and improve safety moving forward in consultation with local governments and First Nations. Of course, the information that you provided on this event has been invaluable, helping focus and guide this process. If you have any further information about debris and hazards or safety events, please again reach out to our community relations team. And that information is provided on the slides and will be provided after this presentation is over. With that wrap up, I'll uh, end tonight's presentation. Uh, we didn't get into a lot of technical details about weather, climate, energy balance that BC Hydro normally to do. So we're happy to field those questions independently or as part of tonight's panel or just follow up with community relations after the fact. Thanks for the opportunity to present again and for all your patience in working with us through these challenging climatic times. Thanks, Rick. Yeah, thanks so much, Darren. Um, and thank you all uh, again for your patience. I know in some cases, some of the information you're hearing tonight is a repeat. Um, we felt wanted to set the stage and provide context uh, and then we also make way for the new information that um, some of which was just shared. So thanks very much, Darren. Uh, I think we are going to go to questions now. And I know some people have been posting questions in the chat and just remind you to please put them in the Q&A box if you'd like them considered. Um, we've got a few questions flagged and, and we have another just over 15 minutes to go through them. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Adina to read out a question and invite our presenters to turn their cameras on um, so that we can answer some questions. Uh, go ahead, Adina, what question do you have for us? Thanks, Brooke. Um, the question I have here is during the summer, the Columbia River was higher than usual. Looking at water levels now, Grand Coulee is at 85% full, Arrow is low, Duncan is down a third, and King Basket is near full. It appears that Arrow was drained to save water at Duncan and King Basket. Could there not have been a better sharing of water levels? It is also tough to think we are in drought when they spill water over Coulee for a light show every night during the summer. Who would like to take that question? Uh, well, perhaps I can start just on how we balance Kin Basket, Revelstoke, Arrow Levels, and, and Duncan. So effectively, there is almost 20,000 gigawatt hours worth of energy in Kin Basket and Revelstoke, which is vital for us to preserve and manage across the winter. Arrow generation is perhaps 1 20th of that. So in terms of 
sharing or managing the water in King Basket, had we had more flexibility across the rest of the system to generate more or rely on the Peace or the Lower Mainland or Vancouver Island across the winter, then it would have afforded us the opportunity to discharge more from Kin Basket and then conversely prop up Arrow more. But that was not the case because the drought was not only local to the Columbia, but it was provincial wide. Uh, Duncan levels were higher, but this year we actually drafted Duncan below its recreation targets and uh, balanced the fisheries concerns downstream. So it was operated lower than it would have been across the summer and again to offset even further deeper drafts of Arrow. A foot at, uh, at Arrow is worth eight feet at Duncan, so it's hard to offset Arrow levels by drafting Duncan. There's also the comparative reservoir draft. So Kin Basket over the course of the winter has the flexibility to draft almost 150 feet. Average year, we might do 120 feet. So Arrow was drafted 40 feet over the summer. Duncan Reservoir, in the course of supplying its flows for obligations for TD downstreams, will probably be drafted about 100 feet before the winter is done as part of its normal operations. So I hope that sort of helps understand the importance of keeping water both in Kim Basket and how we had tried to help balance the system. I'm wondering if someone can speak to Grand Coulee and, and Lake Roosevelt. There's a lot of concerns clearly about why Lake Roosevelt is kept high when Arrow is suffering so, so monumentally. And we've heard the Columbia River Treaty has requirements to send water down south. Um, wondering if there can be an elaboration on that or anything further to, to say. Maybe I, I can just start with that. So Grand Coulee also has a tremendous amount of generation there. So I expect both for the fishery management purposes that Grand Coulee needs to support over the winter and for their own energy management needs. That's why water was not discharged. So arrow that would have flown from, uh, water that would have flown from arrow into Coulee and then discharged over the summer was not because they are keeping it in their reservoirs the same set of reasons that we are for generation across the winter. The Columbia River Treaty also does not oblige uh, the U.S. entities to use the water in any particular way once it flows down the border so they can choose to manage it for energy purposes, fisheries, navigations, or the myriad of needs that they have downstream. We did work with them throughout the summer to try to offset even deeper drafts at Arrow, and as, as um, mentioned lightly in the presentation, provided perhaps about eight feet and seven feet of additional offset of general uh, arrow draft this summer. Kathy, do you have anything more you want to add with ops on Roosevelt? No, just um, to, to just reiterate that how uh, the BC dams uh, are operated is as per the current treaty to maximize power in the United States. Hence, the water is flowing at certain rates at certain times of the years to do exactly that for which we are compensated. And that is why we want to make changes to rebalance that a bit, to be able to address uh, issues like recreation, low uh, Arrow Lake Reservoir levels, fisheries, salmon reintroduction. Um, and so, but right now, the current treaty has steps along the way in, inside the treaty that dictates when to release water under what conditions across the border. And that information is, you know, uh, treaty, treaty language and definitely can share. I know somebody wanted to see the treaty language and the steps that are followed to do exactly that. Thanks, Kathy. I think we'll go on to another question here, Adina. Yeah, will there be any initiatives to improve spawning channels on more creeks along the Arrow Lakes? Maybe I'll pass that question to, to Ryan, because it's out, although a keen interest for me, Ryan can probably speak to that. Thanks, Darren. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, you know, I just want to start off the, the province is the lead on resource management, so I can speak a bit on, on BC Hydro, but I, I just want to acknowledge that. Um, in terms of projects, there are a couple large avenues to put forward proposals like that where we work together. The Fish Wildlife Compensation Program does a lot of work and, and physical works on, on, on streams and tributaries. Um, it also could be raised as an issue in water use planning and, and the order of review. So there's a couple larger avenues for those issues to be raised. I do want to reinforce some stuff that 
that Darren mentioned, just of course, we're reviewing all, all info to date. But today, again, we did show that, that the Kokanee are accessing the main tributaries that, that they're spawning out of. So at this point, we believe habitat's not being shown to be limiting. And we're fortunate in that Kokanee are, are stray spawners as well. So if they can't get into an area, they will go find another one. They're not tied to, to, to spawning in a, in a certain tributary. There's also the risk of, of luring them, you know, in increasing access to bring them into a trip that might then dry up or have sub suboptimal habitat conditions, lethal temperatures and the things. So there's all sorts of things you want to consider before artificially um, increasing kokanee access into tributaries for spawning. Thanks. Thanks very much, Ryan. Uh, Adina, another question. Um, yeah, here's another one. If a more constant lake level was agreed upon in the new treaty, say 20 uh, foot fluctuations, uh, what would be the downsides as far as flood control and power generation? I can I can try to answer that. So that's what we're bottling right now. Um, Arrow used to uh, fluctuate naturally uh, more than 25 feet. Um, and so keeping it constant is not a, a natural uh, uh, operation or is not a natural phenomenon. But what we are looking at is uh, changing the operations to fluctuate less and to see whether we can um, uh, operate uh, the system so that floodplains are increased, riparian ecosystems are increased, wetlands are created, and that's exactly what we're looking at. And, and that research and that modeling is being led by uh, the Canadian Indigenous Nations with the participation of uh, BC government and Canadian government uh, scientists and technical people. They're, they're, um, some of the work has been shared uh, at a, during a virtual meeting, and it's also on our website, on what kind of values they're looking at. They're also looking at um, what they call um, uh, functional flows that try and, and, and see whether we could change operations to mimic the flows to some degree, not completely, the, the dams are always going to be there, but to mi mimic some of the flows during certain periods, uh, to, to mimic what was there naturally to um, support fisheries and for example, eco um, cottonwood uh, systems. So that is going to, that is being looked at. And and it, it all started actually in, in the Arrow Lakes um, when uh, people in, in the Cusp and Burton Edgewood all wanted us to look at way back when to look at what a stabilized um, arrow would would uh, could how it could benefit not only ecosystems but also keeping in mind the appropriate recreation levels. So it is being modeled currently by a, a group that will and that work is going to be shared as I said earlier with all of the the basin residents. So you can see what changes uh, in operations may look like and what it will benefit. Thanks very much, Kathy. Adina, another question. Um, yeah, what is the minimum lake level for full power production at the Arrow Dam? Sorry, was that a question at which dam? Adina, you might be muted. Which dam was it that the question was referring to? Sorry, it was the Arrow Dam. It's, it's Jillian here. It sounds like there's a question. Um, just gonna turn on my phone. I'm having some technical difficulties earlier. So I've called in as well as I was joined on the web. Um, uh, maybe clarify the question. Is this related the question around Aerolix Hydro? Yeah, so the question just is, what is the minimum lake level for full power production at the Aero Dam? Okay, so for full power production, Aero Reservoir needs to be at 1420 feet and above. Below that, uh, the discharge capability begins to reduce uh, because there is... Um, certain amount of discharges that reduces as the reservoir drafts. That's just uh, following the operating requirements for the, the Aerolix uh, hydro units. 
And then by around 1400 feet, um, food generation needs to be curtailed because there's just not sufficient head to support generation at those levels. Hope that answers the question. Thanks, Jillian. Okay, I next. might just add some context though, that the amount of generation that comes from Arrow is, is very small compared to the combined generation that we see through King Basket and, and Revelstoke. And of course, that starts out with the stores that we have in Kimbasket Reservoir. Thanks, Darren. Also add that it doesn't change the total flow that is coming out of Arrow Reservoir because um, all it cha changes is that whether we dispatch it through Aerolix hydro generation or, um, or we spill that water through Kinney site, the amount of water that is required um, is really dictated by the Columbia River Treaty uh, as Darren said earlier, we uh, we don't have this magic wand where we could send more or less water um, under the treaty. We have to send exactly the amount that is required, and there are lots of checks and balances uh, with our partners in on on the treaty. Thanks very much, um, Adina. Another question. Uh, is there a posted location where we can view updates with treaty negotiations? Transparency would be appreciated. Maybe I can answer that one. Uh, so on the Provincial Government Columbia River Treaty website, we post updates after each round of negotiations, and we'll pop the link in the chat. It's um, For those who are listening in, it's engage.gov.bc.ca forward slash Columbia River Treaty. You can also Google B province of BC Columbia River Treaty. Um, and the, the releases, the media releases that are issued after each round um, might not seem like they have tons of information, but if you read through them, you can see the nuances of how the negotiations have changed and shifted over time. Um, and we just released uh, an info bulletin earlier this week after last week's round of negotiations um, that that contains some promising language. So I encourage you to, to seek that out. Thank you. Another question, Adina. Can Keeleyside Dam be converted to a power generation dam, which would provide incentive to maintain a higher water level in the area? So that's effectively what Arrow Lakes Hydro is. So Kinley Side Dam has the original dam that was built from the treaty with its low level outlets for spilling and the spogs for spilling during flood routing and of course the navigation lock. Next to it, uh, Arrow Lakes Hydro, called the Power Corporation, built a facility and that provides power there. The power that you get out of a dam though is more related to how much head or like how high the water is and so there's a tremendous amount of energy and potential behind Revelstoke and Kim Basket, just given the height of those reservoirs and how those generations, not so much as Aerolix Hydro. So that's why Aerolix Hydro only pro provides a very small contribution to our overall generation system. Uh, for similar question you know, is why don't we build a generation station at Duncan? And again, with the amount of water and the headway there, it's not necessarily practical at this time. Thanks so much, Darren. So we have time for one more question before we wrap up today. Go ahead, Adina. Um, if a new agreement is agreed to, will it be another 60 years before it can be changed again? 10 years would be rational. That's a good question. A absolutely not. And uh, the original treaty had a minimum life of 60 years, but as I mentioned, it's, it continues on forever unless either country issues a 10 year notice, notif notice for termination. Um, but, you know, this is why uh, both countries, Canada, BC, and, and the United States, are looking to um, uh, incorporate an adaptive management framework into a modernized treaty because things are, are changing so rapidly, not only climate change, but new technology, new, new, you know, you look at California with their solar and, and enhanced battery and how it's changing up how uh, power electricity is generated and stored and at what times of the day. And, and there's constantly uh, new policy developments in both Canada, BC, United States, and 
as we see now, people want to see changes that are broader than what the original treaty purposes were. And in particular, uh, the recognition uh, of uh, the United Nations Declaration of Rights of Indigenous People and the strong voice that our Indigenous nations bring to the table. So uh, no, we're, it's, it's not going to be fixed and that's why adaptive management is going to be uh, part of the treaty going forward. And it could be the other the other thing is that there's nothing to say that in the, in the past 60 years that we couldn't have changed any element of the treaty. The treaty can be changed at any time as long as both uh, countries want to make changes and, and look for improvements. Thanks so much, Kathy. Um, we are unfortunately at time here, everyone. There's some incredible questions in the Q&A, uh, and I'm really sorry we don't have time to answer them tonight, uh, but we will, I reiterate our commitment to get answers out to you all uh, as soon as possible. Um, and of course, this recording will be available in the next few days. We'll make sure that you receive it in your email. Uh, we also will circulate a feedback survey so you can share additional comments and let us know how tonight went. We're always looking to improve these sessions. Um, and maybe a final note that this isn't, um, you, know, you know, this is far from the end of the conversation and many of the folks here tonight are available afterwards uh, and we'll put contact information up at the end here before we we end the meeting. Uh, please send us emails and um, and continue this conversation. But uh, I really appreciate everyone's time. Thank you again to all of our panelists for being here tonight. Thank you sincerely to everybody who uh, takes the time to listen. Obviously, this has been a really um, challenging, it's the word of the day, challenging year. And uh, yeah, really appreciate being able to have sessions like this to continue uh, sharing information. So um, with that, I will say good night and thank everybody once again. Uh, we're going to, again, share some information on a slide here. Um, and I'll leave the meeting open for a little bit so people can take note of that. Uh, and then we'll wrap it up. So really take good care, everybody, and have a good rest of your day.